Um, my name is Matt Hornsby. I am one of the directors of engineering at Supply Chain uh, within Nordstrom. And today I just I wanted to talk with you a little bit about how we use event-driven architectures to power um, some of the views of the company's most valuable asset, which is our inventory, uh, along with some of the learnings that we had along the way. Let's see if this works. Okay. Um, actually, I tricked you. I, I, I want to do, well, let's break this apart. I want to do a few sort of miniature talks today, um, tonight, I guess. Uh, I hope that a lot of these will just be interesting on their own, but um, when we take those together, hopefully they'll uh, show some ways that we attacked a fairly tricky problem at Nordstrom. So first I'll walk you through uh, a little bit about the realities of retail, and then we'll talk about this tricky problem, and then I'll walk you through what I'm sort of tentatively calling enterprise trust patterns. I haven't quite figured out the right phrase uh, to coin there, but um, how do we make all of this stuff work? Question is, this is a very, still a very new architecture, still a very uh, new way of thinking about designing large scale systems. And the question I always have when I see something that is dramatically new like this is, well, this is great, but how do I actually convince my company to let me do this? So let's dive into that a little bit later. Okay, so let's start with the problem, um, retail inventory. So inventory is one of those things I've found that doesn't seem like it should be that hard. Um, there's a lot of subtle challenges that make it sort of tricky. So I'm gonna try to walk a few of the, th through a few of these to give you a taste of it. So first off, who here has ever shopped on the Nordstrom website? Don't be shy. All right, so most of you. So you've probably seen something like this. I'm sure that you've shopped for similar shoes in the past. <laughs> This is a view of our product detail page. So uh, highlight on, highlighted on the right here is uh, a picture of our available SKUs. So for us, when I talk about SKU, I just mean kind of the lowest level of granularity about a product. So in this case, you get a SKU when you choose a size and a color of this very stylish shoe. So it's important that we can accur accurately depict the items that we believe that we can actually sell to you and that we can send when you order this online. So um, you're gonna be very unhappy and disappointed if you try to order something that we said is here and only to learn later that it was sold out. This is actually a challenging problem for, for Nordstrom. So um, one thing I'll say about this page is uh, this is this data is loaded, it's rendered um, on demand with API calls when we render this page. So there's nothing terribly unique about um, how we query this data. It just needs to be really fast because we're we can't we don't want to delay the the product page render so these are just normal rest api calls that we say hey for this product which is made up of many different SKUs, each one of these sort of size and color combinations is a skew for each one of those do we have it do we think that we can show this to you so before you get to the product page though, generally you have to find your way to that page. And usually what that means is that you're searching in some way, you're, you're trying to discover that product that you're looking for. Uh, so you generally start by, by searching. This is our search page. Um, even though you might not actually do a free text search, which you can do, uh, all of these pages are, are powered by a search engine. So you might click on, in this case, women's shoes as a category, but it's just, it just triggers a search query. So um, that's how we render those results. So surely this can't be all that difficult, right? I mean, you've got some big warehouses, some inventory tracking, some warehouse management, et cetera, but it's sort of easy until you bring human beings into the mix. So human beings are pretty messy. Like we, we leave things on the changing room floor in a store and we pile things up outside the changing room floor. We sometimes hide things, like that last <coughs> thing. We, we're gonna come back later, so we're gonna put it behind a pile of clothing. And uh, sometimes we steal things. So um, the picture of our inventory is really challenging sometimes. Um, our inventory systems might say, yeah, we've got this. And I walked out the door a couple days ago. So we also, Nordstrom's a high-end fashion retailer, so it means we stock some strange items. Um, so you've probably heard of some of them in the past, uh, over the last couple of years. So things like pet rocks and shredded up jeans. My favorite, I think, is we had these uh, jeans with transparent vinyl windows, like tape sewn into the, the knee right there. 
We call them transparent knee mom jeans. <laughs> this is high fashion. I'm sure you guys understand this. But because of this, we don't keep a lot of different things in stock. Um, much of what we provide to our customers is exclusivity. And what that means is maybe we only do a single run of some items from, from a designer that we work with. And it's also mostly high-end. So exclusive means that we don't have a lot of it. And high-end means it's expensive. And then you add into this the idea that fast sort of a perishable item, in a way. Last season's trends, right? So it's, it's sort of like bananas, in a way. Oh, by the way, this is a $13,000 Gucci uh, coat here. So how many of those do you think that we keep in stock? <laughs> Probably not too many. So finally, we sell a lot of different <coughs> items. This actually surprised me before I came to Nordstrom. Um, we sell many different SKUs. It's not just shoes and clothing and stuff like that. You'll see things like housewares and electronics and things of that nature. Um, and some products like cosmetics, lipsticks, and things like that, um, and like men's dress shirts, they have a lot of SKUs. So like a men's dress shirt could have hundreds of different combinations of like sleeve length and and collar length and color and stuff like that. Um, but it's millions. It's millions of active SKUs that we're selling at any given time. So for me, the mind kind of boggles at that number. It's hard to even imagine what this looks like. And you know, I've been to some of our, I've been to our warehouses, and they're giant hundreds of thousands of square foot warehouses. Um, but it, it's still, even at that scale, difficult to understand what this level of, of SKUs looks like. So if there's anybody from Amazon, you guys are probably laughing at this number. But um, for us, it's challenging because um, some of the, the challenges with uh, that we don't buy very much and we fulfill things out of our store. So uh, I'll leave you with this last point before wrapping up this crash course. It's something many of you might already know if you've uh, shopped at Norson before, but when you buy something online, uh, we often will fill your order out of a store. So we'll try to get things out of our fulfillment centers. That's the most cost effective. Um, but if we don't have it there, we treat our stores as a fulfillment center. Um, but stores are not optimized to be fulfillment centers. They're, they're optimized for retail floor space. Um, and they're optimized to not have very much stock room real estate. In fact, some of our stores don't have any at all. Everything that you see is out on the floor. So this is great for you and me when we're walking around and we're looking to find that like perfect cocktail dress. But, it's really bad for the people who are trying to take an online order and try to find that in the store. Sometimes that's the last remaining item in our entire network, um, but they have to find it on the floor somehow, package it up, and send it to you. So uh, that last item, you know, it might be hiding behind a cash register. Somebody just returned it. Um, it could be on the floor of a dressing room. Uh, it could have been stolen, like I said. It could have been put on a mannequin earlier that day and moved to some weird place in the store that nobody knows about. Um, and I'll also say that there's just simply not enough space in our stores to carry a lot of every different size of everything. Even if there were, it'd be, basically it would be too cost prohibitive to stock a whole bunch of those Gucci coats. Um, so each store has precious few. Oh, you like that? Should I click on, on signal? Okay. We'll, we'll see what uh, state secrets I'm giving away. Um, so I guess the point is when you add up all of these large amount of products, this wide variety of things that we buy, but the limited runs that we have, the high price tag, and the perishability of our fashion, and you put physical stores with unpredictable human beings, you get a very challenging landscape. So all right, one talk down. We're done. Two more to go. So. Now you are all experts on retail inventory. You're like, you're like Neo from The Matrix. I'm probably dating myself here, but instead of knowing Kung Fu, now you know a lot about like mannequins and stuff like that. <laughs> okay, so a little bit of housekeeping before we get into the guts of this uh, event-driven architecture part. Um, the phrase I find event-driven, event streaming, um, events, all of that, they all mean a lot of different things to different people. Um, so I don't want you to be disappointed. I want to head that off of the past. We'll go in with low expectations. So let me start off by talking about what we're not going to see here. So this design that I want to talk to you a little about today is not CQRS, although it takes a lot of inspiration from some of those things, if you're familiar with, uh, with how CQRS works. You're not going to see commands and queries modeled 
as first class citizens in this design. But what you will see is this notion of observations and decisions. And then you'll see autonomous processes that make decisions based on those things. So you're not going to see one system telling another system to do something on behalf of, of my needs. You're going to see some decisions, some observations about the state of the world, which will allow uh, those systems to make some decisions on their own. So this design is also not specifically event source, though it's fundamentally based on events as the originating source of, uh, of all activity, basically, that you'll see. Um, it's also just not a message bus or a queue or an enterprise service bus or a message broker. So what is it? Well, now that I've hopefully set your expectations low enough, let's get into the meat of the design of what this is. So, um, what I hope that you'll see when we go forward with this is what appears on the surface as a pragmatic design. Um, and it, it's, what I want to show is something that has some subtly powerful implications under the surface, but um, we sort of deliberately built this system in a way that didn't seem threatening, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. And I'll talk about that in the last part of the talk here, but um, one of the analogies I use a lot is, um, in, in big companies specifically, um, there's, it's an organic system, and it's based on, uh, you know, human beings. And, and I like to think of this as almost like you've got things like immune systems. And just like the human immune system, anytime you see something new, the antibodies come out in force and attack that thing, right? Even if it's a good thing. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about a little bit later is ways that uh, we can maybe think about how do we not appear as threatening to that institutional immune system and maybe circumvent it a little bit. So I'm not going to advocate tricking your business. Um, that almost never turns out well. But what I will suggest is, and we can dive in a little bit more details, is there's some ways that we can ease an organization into a very different landscape without running afoul of those antibodies I was talking about. So um, if the team that built this did their job, everything here should just sort of seem like common sense. It should just seem safe even though we're kind of exploring uncharted territory at the company. Okay, so enough preamble, let's get going. Um, before I move on to this next slide and give away an answer, I have a question for you all. What do you think, when we're talking about inventory, what types of data do you think goes into deciding whether or not we will show a piece of inventory as available for, for purchase on our website? So Nordstrom people, be quiet for this one. You're all experts anyway. So. But the rest of you are now experts on inventory uh, since we went through this. Um, so you know that it's not merely about just raw inventory on this. So what are some things that you think might go into whether or not we want to show a piece of inventory on our website? Any ideas in the back? Count of items available. Yep. Count of items available. What else? Where it is. Where it is. Why, why, why would that be important? Uh, to be able to ship it to the person. Yep. Yep. That's a good one. Very good. Do you want to come work at Nordstrom? <laughs> Over here? How recent is the last update to a SKU status? How recent is the last update to the SKU status? That's a good one. Um, okay. There's a lot of stuff. I've, I mean, there's a few things here, but there's a lot of different pieces of information. There's a, uh, there's a lot that we need to look at or, or things that we would like to look at that we, we haven't uh, implemented quite yet. But some of these seem like they'd be pretty straightforward, like the actual inventory levels and where we have it. Um, things like sales velocity, how quickly is this thing selling? You know, so uh, if we only have one of these left, but it's some weird rug that nobody buys, like we can probably show that safely on the website. But on the other hand, if we have quite a few things and then Beyonce tweets out that she really likes these, you know, shoes or whatever, all of our followers are going to come and start buying this stuff, so we have to be, we have to care about how quickly things are selling. Um, but some of them might be, might seem weird if you look up there, things like price, like why, why does price, what does price have to do with whether or not we show something on our website? Um, but not everything at Nordstrom is expensive, um, plus we don't charge shipping on anything. So one of the challenges is that it's expensive for us to ship things out of our stores. If it comes out of a fulfillment center, it's pretty well owned, the, there's less labor, um, we've got deals with all of the shippers, but when it needs to come out of a store, um, 
it can be fairly expensive. So like if a price ever drops beneath a certain amount to where we're not making enough money on it anymore, when you take in shipping and labor and all of that stuff, we don't want to sell it. We don't want to put it on the, the website and potentially sell that to you because we'll be at a loss. Do so the customers matter? Like if I'm a valued customer, am I someone? <coughs> yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, the question is, um, does it matter who the customer is? Um, I would say it does matter. Um, we do look at things like um, Nordstrom has loyalty levels. So we look at things like how good of a customer, how much do you spend with us? Um, and that's something that we fold into some of our algorithms um, for uh, things like some of our search algorithms and some of the things that we surface up to people. Um, we don't fold that in directly into this picture yet, but it's definitely something that um, is an important piece that we want to look at. So there's a lot of different data points that we need to consider here. So um, before we go through the uh, rest of the slides, um, just know this is just a handful of different things. So I'm going to show you some, some, I'll put some boxes up here that represent some of these things, but uh, think about that there's a lot more on there. So uh, I wanted to go back really quick to the kind of the fundamental functional challenge that we faced that drove us to kind of pursue this event-driven architecture that I'm going to go into in a, a, another slide here. The key challenge here uh, from an inventory perspective is that we can't make the same call to an inventory API to get the available SKUs that we do when we're looking at a search results page. There's a couple of reasons. So first, um, there's various search facets that you'll see over here, and we can't just simply make a real-time API call every time that you click on one of these different you know, colors and sizes and, and price ranges and things like that. This has to be really quick. So um, this is all done through search indexing. And so it's done proactively and continuously. We're constantly updating our search indexes. So um, this isn't something where a, an API call is even possible at this point. Um, even if we could, the code would probably look terrible. So secondly, um, this, this is just one of UX. Um, if you were to see this page and scroll down, you'll, you'll see it's not an endless page. We try to display 50 or 60 items. So what happens when you call an API and you say, hey, give me, give me these 50 items and 48 of them are available and two of them aren't, but you have to like fill in the extra. So you, do you make another call for the other two to fill this in and then one of them's not available and you play this weird cat and mouse game. So, um, or do you just call with a whole bunch and hope that you get enough to fill in a page? But um, really it's just sort of a moot point because of the first thing, which is we just don't have the time. We can't afford to be making API calls for all of these different uh, sort of search facets that you see on the page here. So um, the product page that we saw at the beginning, that's very poll based. Every time that you load up the page, we gotta, we're gonna ask the question of all of these SKUs, which ones are available uh, for us to fulfill. But in this case, we have to push. We have to push appropriate updates into the search indexes. Okay, so pretty straightforward, but uh, I just wanted to call out uh, as we go into this, we've got all of these different events, um, these important events that flow into a set of Kafka topics, and they come from external teams. Every one of these pieces of data comes from some external team uh, who own that data, and they come in sort of independently in an unpredictable order, um, but we need all of the data before we can make a decision about whether or not this thing is actually available, right? Um, then we'll pull all this data in, we run it through our sort of availability algorithms and spit out this thing is not available. Uh, but every time a new piece of information comes in, we have to consult with all of the rest to see if this causes an item to become available or unavailable. And this state transition is, is really important for us. So there's two major scenarios that we have to account for. Um, so let's start with the easy one. Pretend that we have a product that we've been selling for a long time and all of the upstream systems have sent us all of this data. It's all, we, we have access to this now, right? We know the price, we know how much we have, we know where it's supposed to be, et cetera. So the first major design concept I wanted to introduce is this sort of, this notion of merge, compare, and report. So let's walk through it. Um, at the top, these colored boxes represent some of the pieces of data. Um, I'm not sure if that's too much of an eye chart, but Imagine that each one is a different one of those pieces of data about inventory and price. Um, and 
we've already collected all of this from incoming Kafka topics. Don't get too hung up yet on how we query the data. I'll, I'll detail that in a bit. So um, step one is uh, here we've got all the data and a new inventory piece of data comes in um, and arrives with an update. Um, so what we do is we need to pull all of the data that we have together. We pull all of the current data and compare that with what the picture was a moment ago before this came in. So we're not storing the results of, of these availability pictures. We're essentially saying, what was this a moment ago? What is it now? And we run two sets of calculations. We run the calculation on the old data and say, this was not available. In this case, we didn't have any in stock. But now we have this new piece of information about inventory. And we run the, the availability algorithms again and say, yep, it's good. Um, we've got. Uh, these two things are different. We know we need to send out a new state change. Okay, so I, this is a wall of text. I, I'm just dropping this in here, so if you come back later, you'll have some extra data on the key points. But I promise we won't have any more of these. Um, but I did want to say, like, why do we do? Why do we do all of this? Why not just store the results of previous calculations, and then just do one calculation when the new piece of data comes in? So um, first we need all the information to do any of the calculations. So we need those individual pieces of data. Um, so there's that. Um, second, we need to know if the new piece of information is actually new. Um, this is how we deal with duplicates or out of order messages, problems in other systems where they've already sent this data or they send us something old. Um, so we timestamp messages and they all are uh, item potent. Um, and then there's also this issue of trust, which I've included here, but I'll cover later. So if you could circle back, you'll have a little bit more context there. Um, one added side benefit of storing all of this information is that we, uh, we constantly are changing our algorithms. And we're trying to hone in on the secret sauce of how do we, we thread this needle between showing you essentially raw inventory that we can't really sell to you versus um, being too restrictive and not selling enough. So, Anytime that we have new algorithms, we can just run those new algorithms on the, the raw data and not have to deal with like recalculating stuff or understanding what the state was um, when we stored this before. Okay, so the harder problem is when we're, when we're missing some data. So what happens if we're missing something? This is a scenario when we have a new product that is set up for the first time and we've got all of these key pieces of information flowing in from other systems, and they, they don't all arrive at exactly the same time. We get one piece of information before the rest. So the second concept I wanted to go through uh, is this idea of um, fetching missing data and putting it back on the stream. So um, this is a new product. This is the first time that we've seen product data. So it's not up there. There's a missing uh, piece there. Um, and we have this new data come in. We also don't have inventory data about this. Um, so what we do is we just fill this in. We store this extra piece of information. Um, and then I wanted to introduce um, this new component. We don't have enough information to proceed with the calculation. We need to, we haven't received that inventory data for some reason. This could be that there was an error. It could be that this is a brand new, uh, a brand new item that was set up and inventory data hasn't yet flown in from that system. Um, but we treat all of those things similarly. I want to introduce this concept of uh, this API data producer is what we call it. So it, this is just a Kafka consumer producer that's listening on a topic. Um, and its only job is to notice when we're missing a piece of data. So when this new product comes in, we look for everything. And we say, actually, we're missing this piece of inventory. So we need to go out and get that. Um, in this case, it calls the same inventory REST API that is responsible for showing the product page. Um, and it drops it on the appropriate uh, Kafka topic. So to the rest of the system that you saw in the previous scenario, it basically just appears as though the, the event came from the originating system. So we're going out and triggering that. Um, but you might ask why, like why would the originating system have it when we call for it, but it didn't send it originally, right? Um, that's a great question. I mean, one is, like I said, it just hasn't arrived yet. Um, and when we call that REST API, it may be there at that point. Uh, for those 
we like if it doesn't exist, we, we simply just move on. We don't do anything with this data because we know that some other piece of information is going to come in later. Um, so we don't send any information out. This is an incomplete product picture. So we just wait. We don't really do anything here. So what this looks like is so we go out to the inventory API, we drop it in there, and then we can proceed with calculations because now we have all of the information. So I want to uh, spend the next couple of slides <coughs> just bringing some of these pieces together and start filling in some of the gaps. So here we have a picture of new inventory flowing in on the left-hand side there. And it arrives on a Kafka topic that's represented by that first gray arrow over there. Um, and we have this consumer producer that receives the message. And um, I just have it listed here as inventory consumer producer. All this thing does, its, it's life is to um, normalize data, strip out information that we don't need. It allows us to sort of isolate ourselves from changes um, in the upstream systems that we don't care about. Like if they add new data, we don't, we don't necessarily need to deal with that. So this is sort of a cleansing process. Um, and it drops that cleansed and normalized data onto another topic that we call this merge topic here. So messages that are received on that merge topic that, that get picked up by the merge consumer producer, um, that is a process whose job it is to fetch all of the other data from this cache. So I didn't go into this before, um, but we're not reading all of these pieces of information directly from Kafka topics. We're actually pulling these in and we're storing the current state of all of our SKUs and all of these pieces of information um, in, in this case, a Redis cache. It just needs to be a very fast uh, lookup. And so uh, that merge consumer producer, its job is uh, to take all of the information that we have and merge it down into that picture that we saw before that had all of the current state and the new pieces there. So we're just showing what's happening on one of the systems um, with the inventory picture, but um, this happens for uh, a whole bunch of different systems that we deal with. So this merge consumer producer drops requests for missing data onto a stream. It's picked up by this blue component that we went over before, the data producer. And its job is to just go and pick up all of the, the missing information, or at least try to, and drop it back into a topic that we saw and just proceed as we did before. So if we zoom out a little bit, um, this, is, this is with a whole bunch of the data sources. Um, this isn't all of them, but there's, uh, you can see this sort of replicated. And uh, it all comes together in this merge process. And then we show kind of the final data here being sent out. Um, and we pick that up and process the full picture when we have it um, with these inventory availability algorithms and send out any state changes that we see. So um, one thing that I, I didn't cover before, but when we talk about, um, in our case, we're trying to push information out to a search index process. And so you can imagine that any time a new piece of data comes in here, we just do one calculation and we say, Yes, it's available, and we send that piece of information out to the search indexes. And it could be that the information that comes in isn't anything that's materially uh, like something that we care about. It doesn't change the state of availability. It was available for purchase before, and it's still available. And another piece comes in, and it's still available. And we keep sending out, yes, 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 yes. So this is going to thrash our search indexes. So this was one of the things where uh, it really drove uh, the need for us to figure out how do we only send interesting state changes of availability. We don't care if it's still available. We care if it was available a moment ago, and now it's not anymore. Because now we have to remove it from the website. We don't want to sell this. Or we got a new piece of inventory in, um, or some other thing changed to make it so that we have more inventory. We now want to send this out so we show it um, in our search indexes. So. Um, we needed to build this system that knows when state changes occur. So in order to know when state changes occur, we have to know what the state is now. We have to know what state is right at this moment so that if we have a new piece of information, we can go out and say, did this change? And then we can go out and notify uh, the systems that we care about, one of which is the search indexes. Um, so 
this is the last part of our second part of the talk here. One of the things I, I wanted to highlight, though, is um, some interesting things that, that we learned, that we discovered along the way. So um, the system that we built here um, as an event-driven architecture, uh, it replaced an older legacy system that would sometimes take an <coughs> excess of hours uh, from the time that we knew about inventory changes to it being reflected in the end systems and on our website on our in-store systems and our mobile apps, it could take hours, which was challenging because you would buy something and then we would cancel it because we didn't actually have it anymore. Um, and with this new system, we've gone from sometimes hours down to seconds or less. So that seems like a very awesome win. Uh, but we did see some unforeseen consequences that we didn't really prepare for from being too fast. So I, I guess these are good problems to have. But um, one thing we, did, we, we found out was that there were some processes within the company, like actual business processes, that were coupled to the slowness. They were coupled to this latency of the system. So one of the things I found most interesting was if you go and you return something to one of our stores and it's in good sellable condition, they scan it right there and it immediately shows up in our inventory management systems. So now with this faster system, it's now immediately available on the website within seconds. So you buy it immediately after somebody just returned it, and then some poor person at that store has to go looking all around the store to find this thing, and it's still sitting on the register. It's still waiting to go back somewhere where they can find this stuff. So it put a lot of extra additional operational burden on people in the stores just because we got too fast. Um, one other thing that we saw was, and we, we planned for this, is there are certain types of events that come into our system that can cause a massive surge of updates. So um, a few months ago, we had a pretty good-sized earthquake up in Alaska, and we had to shut the store down. And this turns out this is something that we, we do fairly often. We have to close a store because of weather, civil unrest, whatever. You, have, you know, There's a lot of different reasons why we'll shut stuff. There's a, you know, there's a riot or something that they have to close. So there's, there's no, actual physical inventory in the stores, but there's nobody there to actually package it up and send it out of the store. So there may be 100,000 different units in that store that we have in raw inventory. We've got to shut that store down, and then this can cause a cascade of unavailability because that might have been the last unit that we had in the entire uh, network of stores. Um, so we had to build a system that could uh, handle these periodic surges. Okay. You've made it. You're now experts on inventory, and you're knowledgeable sort of about the basic architecture um, that we use to tackle the problem of sending out these sort of real-time inventory messages to various parts of our ecosystem. So I, I wanted to say, though, like we've, we've got this weird thing in technology where we like to jump at the new shiny objects sometimes, but we're also very <coughs> skeptical of other people's designs. Like That just seems to be something inherent in engineers, um, especially if they're radically different than what we've ever seen before. So I wanted to wrap up my portion of this talk about with a discussion of, of trust. So um, I know as software developers and engineers and technical people, we don't like to talk about our feelings very much. <laughs> um, but it turns out that in an organization, like I said, where we're starting to look at new and novel paradigms, um, new types of philosophies of software development, um, widely divergent um, ideas on new tech stacks, um, you, you do run into this problem of, how do I sell this? This looks great. How do I do this at my company? It's a question I always ask when I see something new on like the Gardner hype cycle. Okay, so um, I mentioned before that we have uh, this mechanism in place that sort of checks for the, the existing data. And um, there's, a, there's a concept that I wanted to introduce to you. It's, it's not a new concept, but um, we needed to build some things in place that made this not look scary. And we deliberately built parts of the application architecture to account for things that people are afraid of. Um, so things like, well, what happens if, you're, if you rely on events and you miss one? What happens if there's a system failure and you don't receive updates from the inventory service for an hour? Like, 
how do you deal with this stuff? Things that are a little easier when you're just, you know, people are used to dealing with uh, systems that have a centralized database that uh, are, they've got consistency guarantees, they've got asset compliance, all of these things. Now we're in this scary new world of, well, we have eventual consistency, we don't have the guarantees within Kafka for things like um, poison messages. How do we deal with, um, with failures when we don't have built-in retry mechanisms that you'll get out of things like you know, RabbitMQ and, and other message brokering systems? Um, so how do you build that trust? How do you build up um, the confidence in these systems out of the gate so that you can say to your business partners and to your partners in, in technology organizations that this is okay to do? Um, so one of the problems is how do we know if data is stale? We're, we're caching all of this data. How do we deal with what happens when it gets out of sync in some way? So I want to dive into that in a little bit more detail now. And I, I, I'm going to spend the last maybe 10 or 15 minutes kind of talking through some of these trust patterns that we deliberately put into the system with the idea that we could either remove these guardrails later um, or continue to use them uh, to help us understand about the health of the system. So, uh, building a system like this that stores other people's data, this like it causes a lot of trepidation for teams. They're like, I'm the, the owner, I, I, I'm the master of this data, um, you shouldn't store my stuff, just come and ask me for it. Um, and so, when we said, well, we actually need to store this because we need to do state uh, calculations, there's a lot of trepidation. Um, and we were reacting to this giant monolith of a database that we had before we built this out that was the <coughs> sort of common anti-pattern of like all roads lead to Rome, which is this one central database and everything is pumping data into there. Um, and we had layers upon layers of caching. So things would get put into the database, turn out it was too slow, so this API would put some sort of caching in there and then you'd call this API, and then you'd cache it for a little bit, and it was like impossible to reason about the state of anything, right? Like, um, if you ever wanted to do a, a, an atomic update of our inventory picture, you just couldn't do it because it spanned all of these different systems, and there were multiple copies of data everywhere. So when we built this out, we were, we were sort of reacting, and the pendulum was swinging the other way, um, and so we broke out those core systems out of this database, and we put them into microservices that were owned by other teams that could be the masters of the data. Um, and they were responsible for the resiliency of those systems and the performance of those systems. So no more caching data. That was the, that was the story of the day. Just go straight to the source for every call. Um, but now I'm telling you that we cache all of these events from these different systems. So I must be mad. Um, there's really there's just no way around the fact that sometimes in the system that we had here there's state that needs to be stored and it needs to be brought together uh, for this use case so one way is like we'll just go call all of these individual API's over latent faulty networks and do a distributed database join over rest is essentially what uh, we were you know proposing and, and some of the designs I've seen um, but what we we're attempted to do is address what the underlying cause of this fear was, which um, is some of the patterns that I want to talk about here. How do we build trust into the system, and how do we build, how do we bring this entire large sort of tech org into this event-driven architecture space? Um, so self-healing, as much as possible, we wanted a system that was resilient and it would it would uh, recover automatically from known and unknown system problems. So in this example, we set out to address these sort of related problems of like what happens if the cache drifts and what happens if you get bad data or no data for a period of time. But really the underlying question, the underlying fear that was driving this is like what happens if something is wrong? What happens if the data is wrong for some reason? So we took a couple of approaches to this. Um, one was for detection of those problems and the other is for remediation when we ran into those. So um, in this case, a new message arrives we pull all of the related data from the cache, and we have a couple of ideas of, uh, of TTLs in here. So um, one of them that we look at, and I just I deliberately called these something different than what we use, but really we have uh, an indicator that tells us how long is this data fresh until. 
So the idea here was we want to look and see if a piece of data is, is older than we feel comfortable with. And then we compare, we go out and get the new data in that case. Uh, and same thing that you saw before, we have this system that says, hey, we're out of date, go and fetch the latest thing. And in this case, let's say we look at product data and it comes back as different than what we had before. So in the bottom, that's the new data, $500 for this thing. Before it was $400 and change. So this indicates a problem. In theory, we should have gotten the update at some point that updated it to that uh, $500, but it means we didn't get a message or there was something else that went wrong in the system. We don't, we don't know. Um, so we store this new information, we do the calculations like we normally would, um, but we send this out. When we notice this type of problem, um, we emit some error telemetry to say, I don't know what happened, but something went wrong here. We didn't have the most up-to-date information in our cache. So um, we attempt to keep the cache up-to-date, and we alert when it isn't. So we can start looking at uh, some of the patterns there. So I just wanted to mention briefly, um, these TTLs that I mentioned around um, data staleness, one of the things that this allows us to do, we, we do this actually on a per topic basis. So it's not one big TTL on everything. There's pieces of data that change very frequently. Like our inventory picture changes every time somebody buys something, every time somebody returns something, every time we receive inventory. It's hundreds or thousands of times per second. But things like store information, like when a store closes um, or when a new store comes online, that changes like maybe once a day or a couple times a week. We don't need to pummel this system all the time to get new data. Um, so what this allowed us to do was first off to tune this to say um, we're okay with staleness to a certain degree because it's probably not gonna change that much. Um, and given the previous sort of auditing mechanism that I mentioned where we're sending out times where things are out of sync, uh, it allows us to tell is there a problem with a particular system. For some reason, the inventory system is drifting a lot more than all of the other ones. And then we can go and dive in. So once we prove that we can trust the system and that things don't drift, we build up the confidence. We build the trust up in the organization um, that this system is working properly. And then maybe instead of making those real-time API calls to all of these different systems, maybe we can just go to our cache and get that data instead. So it's sort of an evolutionary process. Okay. Um, one thing I wanted to say is that something you learn in retail is that nothing is ever standard. Everything needs an override. There's just like, feels like in the retail space, we're a company of edge cases all the time. And so we needed the ability to deal with some of these uh, potentially large scale system problems. Um, so a few, of, I'll just list a few of them here. Um, the bootstrap idea is that say there's a massive system failure or we need to bring the system up in a new environment um, from a known state. Um, we can just have all of the source systems push all of the data that they have. So this was built into all of the, uh, all the teams that are providing data. They, they need a way of sending everything that they have. So that's just mass, we had a massive problem and we need to build something up again. Um, the redrive process is similar, um, except that we ignore old messages. We'll actually look at what we have in cache. So this is, um, something got slightly out of date from one of the systems, so we're just gonna have them push things and we're gonna keep all the rest of the data. Um, and then the smallest level of granularity is um, sometimes for some reason, like a particular SKU might have a problem. Um, and the downstream system that we pushed information out to, they didn't receive it, they had a problem, who knows. We'll just force it to grab all the information and we'll just force that out. So it will, it will fix problems with, uh, for example, our, our search page. Okay, just a few more slides, I promise. Um, so the other trust pattern is that we put auditing everywhere. We have to be able to understand where there's potentially problems in the system. Um, so one thing that we did here was, I mentioned before that we don't store the state of, of the resulting calculations. That was a small lie. We actually take that and we store that information in a relational database so that we can do things like ad hoc queries about what's the current state of information. We can run audits and we can, um, we've got systems where we can say, 
um, hey, look, what we have in this, this sort of state storage um, appears out of date. It appears out of sync with, with a cache. <coughs> And we can re-trigger and force a whole bunch of these SKUs to be updated um, at once. So um, this is, uh, you know, another area where we just look to see if we have discrepancies and, and know that something went wrong. We can we can audit those. Um, so this one um, I've been calling spectrum of truth. There's this idea that um, as we get closer and closer to taking your money and processing an order, we want to make really sure that we have the most up-to-date picture. So um, in this case, we start out with the idea of like when there's money on the table, we can throw uh, performance to the side. You're, you're in checkout. So if it takes two seconds to get a response versus 20 milliseconds, you're already committed. Like you're, you're going through the checkout process. We just don't want to sell you something at that point that is uh, that we can't actually fulfill. So when money is on the table, here's what we started out with. Just make calls to the resource system. Get all of the data, and that makes everybody feel good that we've got you know, the, the, the most up-to-date information. Um, and we make decisions based on this idea of perceived financial risk. So where it's really risky, let's be careful about using this event data, this, this data that could potentially get out of sync and just go and talk to the systems. So it's a spectrum of of how, how much do you want to go for performance versus how much do you care about the real truth. Um, so stream the data when performance is more critical or where you just can't make API calls. Um, but the interesting part about this pattern is that as you start building out the trust in the system, maybe you don't need to go to those APIs and make these super expensive calls all the time over you know, a faulty latent network. And you just rely on the data that we have and that we're using to, uh, to power other parts of the site. Okay, so this is the last one. Um, I wanted to sort of round this out by um, just kind of circling back to this idea of how can you sort of ease your organization or your team into an architecture like this? Um, we've talked a lot about some of these things already, but um, as you start sort of bolting these, these safety mechanisms on, um, and you start proving out that the system is operating as, as you wanted, you can start thinking about how do we remove some of that scaffolding um, and start trusting that system more so that you don't have to eschew the performance for the trustworthiness of the data. You've proven that it's there. You start relying on the stream for everything instead of making these, these API calls. So the product page that I showed you before now doesn't have to go out and make 20 different calls to render a single page. You already have the information that you need. It's already there, so just rely on that. And you can start to evolve from the idea of don't cache anything to maybe we think about caching the slow moving data. In this case, um, we have store information like I mentioned, and we started off by saying every time that a customer loads up a product page, hundreds or thousands of times per second, we're just gonna fan out and call all these systems. But some of the systems like store information, like that, that never changes. So now we have teams that have to build full on DevOps teams. We have to have people with 24 seven pager duty support. We have to take advantage of um, building up large support teams to allow us to call this thing all the time for data that never changes. It just, it doesn't make sense. So in this case, after we prove the system worked, we just have a cron job that goes out and calls that store data and populates it. So these are some of the things where we can start uh, relying on the cache itself and, um, and you know, continue to move away from some of these scaffolding mechanisms once we build trust up in the system. So um, hopefully I, I didn't go too far over my time. I just want to put some stuff up here. If you have questions, I will stick around. Um, there's some information here about how you can contact me. Um, I hope that uh, this will help you be a little bit more successful in implementing some of these things in your organization. So, thank you. That's good. Thanks. I don't know if we have time for, I can take some questions if we have time. How are we doing? It would be good if, we, maybe like a, just a few.